Uh, welcome uh, to the third panel of this year's Gillette Dialogue on the Rule of Law in East Asia, uh, with this year's theme being Climate Change in Asia Pacific. Our panel today uh, is entitled U.S.-Japan Partnership in Climate Change, uh, and we have two outstanding speakers. Uh, I'm Bruce Aronson, a resident affiliated scholar of the U.S. Asia Law Institute at NYU School of Law, and I'll act as a moderator today. Uh, I would like to thank our co-sponsor, uh, the Apex Study Center at Columbia University, uh, for joining us and helping us up with this program. Uh, before we begin today's panel, I should briefly note uh, two related items uh, of interest concerning the corporate role uh, in climate change in Asia Pacific. Uh, first, on our website, there's a new symposium on the social role of corporations in Asia Pacific. And it's a collection of essays in the Osali East-West uh, study series. And it looks at um, the state of corporate ESG, uh, which is environmental, social, and governance activities uh, by companies in six Asia Pacific jurisdictions. Uh, a number of the essays uh, focus on the issue of climate change and all those have already been posted. Uh, there is an essay on Japan, uh, which I co-authored uh, titled The Rapid Growth of ESG in Japan Through Public-Private Partnership. Uh, unlike today's panel, uh, which will examine uh, Japan's climate change policy from a global perspective, uh, the essay focuses more on the domestic side of climate change activity in Japan, and uh, particularly on the corporate role in addressing climate change. Uh, second, uh, I will be moderating another panel on a similar corporate related topic, uh, the fourth and final uh, Gillette Dialogue panel, um, and that will be titled Corporate Governance and Climate Change in Asia Pacific. We will have three panelists from Australia, India, and Japan uh, who are leading experts in corporate governance. Uh, this will be held next week, uh, Wednesday, March 30, uh, beginning at 8 p.m. Uh, New York time, Eastern Daylight Time. And I hope uh, many of you will be able to participate in that as well to continue our discussion. Uh, for today's panel, we are delighted uh, to have join us um, perhaps the two key formulators of climate change policies, uh, both in Japan during the Abe administration and in the US during the Obama administration. Tomoaki Ishigaki is currently a minister at the Embassy of Japan to the United States. And Pete Ogden is currently Vice President of Energy, Climate and the Environment at the United Nations Foundation. Uh, I think they can uh, rightly be regarded as two important architects or creators of the global architecture for addressing climate change. Uh, the bios are on our website. I will simply note that uh, Tomoaki is from Japan's foreign ministry, but is also known as an excellent communicator, uh, having been in charge of international media, media relations for several years during the Abe administration. And if um, being an excellent communicator doesn't quite fit in with our overall image of Japanese bureaucrats, I suppose that serves as a good reminder that we should avoid reliance on stereotypes. Um, looking at Pete's bio, he served in three different roles relating to climate change uh, policy during the Obama years. I'm not sure I knew there were three different roles, but he did them all, obviously the key person. And one of his hats at the National Security Council uh, was for international climate change and environmental policy. And he has written extensively in that area, including very specifically with respect to Japan's climate change policies. Uh, before we begin, I also need to emphasize uh, that both of our speakers are appearing today strictly in their personal capacities and their statements are opin and opinions are solely their personal views and do not necessarily represent their views of their respective organizations. Uh, our program today is 60 minutes. Uh, we will hear brief presentations from Tomoaki and Pete, and then enter into what I expect will be a very free flowing discussion. Uh, we will respond to as many audience questions as possible. Uh, so please use the Q&A icon, click on that on the bottom of the screen to send us questions. Uh, the chat function will not be operating for the audience. And with that, uh, let's begin. Uh, Tomoaki, will you start please? 
course, Bruce. Uh, thank you very much. And everyone, uh, good morning. Uh, I'm grateful for your very generous, unconventional introduction. I hope that I'll be able to fit into the stereotype of a very obedient and quiet Japanese diplomat, but uh, we'll, we'll see how that goes. So uh, in order to set the conversation going, uh, let me provide a, a quick overview of uh, the, the current or the latest Japanese uh, po uh, climate policy and its background, as well as the uh, opportunities and also continuing challenges. I think that will also tie into uh, the you know, uh, next uh, topic, which would be the you know, uh, Japanese and, and the US's uh, possible uh, cooperation or their common challenges that Pete will be discussing. So as it, I think, first of all, it is important to note that the latest, the key Japanese policy goals that were announced was made last year, first in April and then next in uh, October. Uh, it, both of them goes in the same vein that, you know, to in, uh, enhance the Japanese uh, uh, climate goals to be more ambitious uh, in, before the uh, COP26. But in April, uh, the, the Prime Minister announced that Japan will uh, seek to achieve carbon neutral in 2050. And also in order to align uh, its long-term strategy, uh, it will raise their you know, previous ambition, uh, 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 2030 goal, uh, uh, to seek the reduction of 46% uh, compared to the base year of 2013, and actually with the aim to achieve the 50%. Uh, it was a major sort of breakthrough in the policy uh, community because uh, when I was working on climate negotiations uh, a few years before, I thought that you know this would be a quite an ambitious goal. So it was a major political decision uh, that was taken. And Japan, you know, in line with that announcement, which was made uh, during the uh, climate summit hosted by President Biden online in April, uh, right before the COP26, uh, uh, it also submitted the revised long, I mean, uh, the national uh, 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 national determined contribution NDC, as well as the long term strategy, uh, in October. So that is the sort of basic uh, framework that will be you know, starting our conversation today. But I should emphasize that this was not really an easy decision. And also uh, the way forward is not also smooth path either. Uh, of course, I should add that while there were so many uh, friends and allies why, why, who I worked with who you know, strongly pushed for more ambitious goals, but many I would say, and uh, dare to say that in the business sectors were ra rather uh, say, uh, not convinced of the need to raise the ambition because first they thought that uh, uh, Japan had done so much in the past that they have really in, in enhanced their energy efficiency and uh, did, don't, did, in their view, almost everything to reduce their carbon footprint. So there's not much of a you know, space that they thought that they'd be able to uh, work on. And of course, there's also a certain views from the experience uh, during the uh, uh, Kyoto Protocol and later on that uh, Japan was put in a rather disadvantageous position, where, say, countries like the uh, uh, China, US, or uh, even European Union were not committing you know, much more rigorous uh, GHG uh, reductions uh, compared to Japan. So, I mean, that's the view of the business community. And also, they thought that the additional you know, financial burden would be uh, too costly, both for consumer industry and also for the government in order to accelerate this you know, uh, trend. But in reality, I think it came uh, uh, rather clear that Japan was not necessarily on the top of the energy efficiency uh, efforts. I think that some of the notable examples that is put forth is that the UK, which has you know, introduced uh, their renewables, wind and solar in the past, have become much more uh, energy efficient compared to the last 10 years or so. And I think that has become much more well known among the Japanese uh, business and policy uh, community. Second is that um, there's a strong uh, momentum, global momentum, uh, for raising the ambition for 2030 and 2050 goals, uh, most notably with the you know, uh, uh, start of the uh, Biden administration. I believe that you know, many policy members in Japan thought that uh, this you know, only accelerates, if not you know, uh, slow down. And I think that was a critical awareness that Japan also look for other ways to be more uh, creative or innovative in thinking of you know, uh, raising its ambition. And the third 
is that there are growing concerns among the business community that with you no, know, as uh, you pointed out, Bruce, uh, with the you know, emphasis on ESG investments and, and also efforts through the G20 on the uh, disclosure of uh, climate risks in the TCFD. Uh, many Japanese started to feel that they may be left out in the global competition where uh, you know, uh, the suppliers or the investors will look for companies that are you know, better off with their carbon uh, footprint. So I think all these combination brought to making that uh, ambitious goals that was announced last year. So, uh, so this is the general background of the, where we stand. But I think, you know, as I emphasize, we have great opportunities, but also challenges. So I just like to start with you now focusing on the challenges. First is obviously the uh, Japanese energy mix. So when we when the government revised the uh, policy to raise its ambition to forty to six to fifty percent reduction up by twenty thirty, the Newly revised energy mix consists of 36, 38% of renewables, 20 to 22% of renewables are nuclear, and are 50, about 50%, uh, 56% of fossil fuel, which you know, uh, includes 90% uh, of coal, 20% uh, of LNG, and about 1% of oil. So, as we all know from the, you know, the aftermath of uh, uh, Fukushima uh, earthquake uh, and the tsunami, and also the a nuclear accident, uh, there still remains a major challenge to resuscitate or in, in, increase this presence of nuclear power. At this point, uh, with the 60, uh, about 60 nuclear power plants, um, 24 are already decided to be decommissioned, uh, so we will no longer be able to use. That includes the Fukushima Daiichi and Fukushima Daini, so the, those two uh, 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 complex. And um, only about, say, 10% uh, at, at 10 of those out of uh, say 36 remaining are operational right now. So we'll still have so many that needs to be restarted or, or renewed or you know, uh, start uh, building new ones. But of course, that's a very difficult political decision to make. But again, we only have less than 10% that is now you know, occupies the energy mix for nuclear. So in order to increase that to 20 to 22%, that will be a major uh, political as well as a practical challenge. Also, the other challenge is that uh, how we're going to uh, reduce the government and public burden. So Japan has been able to successfully increase its uh, renewables, but it relied heavily on the feed-in tariffs. And some people started to think that uh, uh, with the you know, fluctuating, um, say, uh, energy prices right now, uh, it will be not so sustainable for the government to keep on uh, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, bringing in public funds. So the, uh, the government will be introducing a new system uh, feeding premium from this April in order to give incentives for the you know, uh, new utility companies to invest more on uh, renewables. So, but we'll see how far that can go. And the last point is that uh, how to maintain an industrial uh, uh, presence in Japan in a way manufacturing in other areas. So I think I'll stop here just to make a point that with the most recent uh, uh, situation that was caused by the uh, global pandemic, as well as the war in Ukraine, made us realize that how we will be able to have a redundancy or reliable supply chain. And there's a strong, uh, say, uh, say a discussion inside Japan to have some of the you know, key uh, facilities or capabilities of manufacturing capabilities inside Japan. So how are we going to um, you know, source the energy for those, uh, say, manufacturing is another area that they need to continue. But the good news is that uh, uh, when, they were, when a major Japanese newspaper conducted a uh, survey for major 100 companies, uh, more than uh, nearly, uh, say, uh, 60% of them thought that they, they can uh, achieve carbon neutral by 2050. And uh, even some of them, about five of them said that they can even achieve. So, you no, know, this is only for their company, but uh, by 2030. So I believe that there's a growing confidence despite all these practical challenges. So I think uh, you know, we'll be working very closely uh, with you know, on global partners, especially with the US on how to achieve this goal. So I'll stop there and look forward to hearing yes, uh, Pete's thoughts on this. Okay, Tomaki, thank you for the very succinct overview defining the issues. Pete? 
Thanks very much, Eberis, and, and thanks, Tomaki, uh, for that very informative uh, opening set of remarks. I, I'll just react to, uh, of the, with a short, short, uh, some thoughts about <clears throat> um, how this looks in an international context, and particularly from the U.S. Uh, perspective. Uh, the U.S. is, you know, I think it's fair to say is a fickle partner when it comes to climate change, uh, that it makes it challenging. Um, for many countries, because we we whipsaw back and forth uh, between being engaged and then disengaged, uh, or even outright hostile to efforts to globally on this issue. I mean, we the United States, you know, worked hard and and, and contributed to developing the the, Montre the the Kyoto Protocol. Then we wouldn't join the Kyoto Protocol. We partnered and and helped to build and played a critical role in building the Paris Agreement. And then Trump withdrew from the Paris Agreement. <laughs> now we're back in. Um, so, so I think it, you know you have to understand all of this in that in that kind of uh, international political context is is important. When when the U.S. is in at the federal level, uh, the U.S. and Japan are staunch partners. I mean, uh, those which makes you know it, it. I'm sure increasingly challenging from the Japanese perspective because Japan has has not. You know, did not bolt from the Paris Agreement when the United States left. In fact, no other country left, uh, which is, I think, a hallmark of its of its durability and, and the wisdom of its of its design. Um, the U.S. Uh, uh, and and Japan, as I during during the Obama administration when that was negotiated, you know, were, were worked really uh, closely and were critical in terms of the overall design of that, of that mechanism. And in particular of the need to have a role for China in it. Um, I think it was incredibly important. It was essential for the United States. Uh, we are not gonna be part of an agreement that, that sort of exempted China from obligations that, that, that other countries were making, um, particularly as that, you know, they are the world's largest emitter. Likewise, it was essential to the United States you know, make make robust and ambitious commitments itself, uh, and Japan as well. And I think that our 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 alignment of perspective on that uh, that balance was critical to its overall formulation. Having you know left, but now returned to the Paris Agreement, I, as as Tomaki talked about, you saw a flurry of activity with the Biden administration trying to reengage to try to reexert its leadership in the space. And I think it tracks closely with what we see in the United States. The United States enhanced its own 2030 target. Japan did as well. The US ended its practice of, of subsidizing overseas coal finance. Japan did as well. So you know you can really see the powerful alignment um, uh, that can take place when when the kind of the political will is there. Um, the I do think that one of the challenges now we face is in the area of climate finance, which is sort of the shorthand for the, the assistance to developing countries that developed countries commit to provide to help them with their own energy transitions and to be more uh, resilient and adaptable in the face of uh, a, a, a environmental calamity that they had very, very little to nothing to do in creating uh, in many cases. Uh, and in that regard, the U.S. and Japan are the two countries looked to and whose obligations to provide large shares of climate finance um, are expected and committed. And Japan has done a much better job than the United States has and plays a critical role in terms of helping to meet that, that global obligation. I do think that while the U.S. is trying to catch up and fulfill its pledges, it really is important. And I think Japan's role as the leading uh, prov provider, of, uh, the country provider of such assistance to really think about how we can do more in that space because the amount is, is small, you know, the commitments are small compared to the scale of the problem, which is makes it sort of all the more essential <laughs> as a matter of, of, of credibility and trust for countries around the world that, 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 that we are, that we do recognize this, the, the urgency and the severity of the problem and the magnitude of the need. And unfortunately, I think while the US has fallen more short, I think Japan too uh, has a big opportunity uh, to, to 
expand its role in that space. I also just want to pick up the a point that Tomaki uh, made that was I uh, very much agreed with. And I think this is an interesting thing in the United States because it's it's an exception to what I've been talking about, which is a kind of a cyclical US engagement cycle based on who controls the White House. But there's, I think in the last, the counter cyclical cycle is that in the, during the Trump years, you saw a really pronounced uh, 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 in, increase in subnational and private sector engagement and interest in climate change as an issue and as, as, a, as a force that it, they had to contend with. And I think in the United States, interestingly, I think some of that dynamic was a product of having a federal government that was very adamant that it was going to do nothing to try to address that problem itself. So there was no, res no, no resources, no regulations, everything was going to be rolled back. And I think what you saw is in that case, governors, mayors, uh, again, private sector actors were realizing and taking on more responsibility for themselves. And, and, and I think in some ways that's, that was very helpful as a foundation because that's not as partisan of an issue. If you're a mayor of a town and you have to contend with the realities of climate change, you, there's a level of accountability uh, and uh, desire to, to, to meet those needs in a more practical way um, that sometimes in, in Washington or often in Washington it gets lost on this issue in, 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 in with all the partisanship. So uh, uh, that, that area though is, is sort of a new surge in the United States. I think it coincides with what Tomaki said which is a kind of growing internalization of that fact in Japan too, in those spaces. And I think that's an area where even though right now we have in both countries, a kind of high level federal ambition, it's gonna be only achievable if we can really galvanize that, that the rest of society on it. And so I'm, I, you know, I think I'm hopeful that that could be one area that we could try to build out um, over the coming years as well. So thank you. Well, thank you very much. Um, interesting comments from both of you. And uh, I want, don't want to put in another advertisement, but the, the role of corporations in the private sector will be the subject of our next panel, um, focusing on a number of countries in Asia. But going back to um, Tomaki's point, so at one point, Japan thought it was doing well, and then more recently, it thought it was falling behind. And uh, Pete talked about that as well. There's more to do. Uh, when we look at Japan or any country's climate change policy. Um, what, what, what do you think of? What are the criteria in your mind for evaluating whether it's relatively robust or not? Um, how do we, is, is Japan's climate change policy um, moving ahead more recently? Is it still lagging behind? And uh, what would you base that, that view on? I mean, I think the short answer for that is actually the ambition that is expressed in their uh, 2030 and 2050 goal. Of course, you could ask or you know, aim for much higher, but uh, even for the practitioners and policy and business committee uh, point of view, uh, the current 46 to 50, as well as the carbon neutral 2050 are very ambitious. So. I mean, as I said, you could uh, you know, see from both perspective whether the cup, you know, glass is half full or half empty. But I tend to think that uh, yes, you no, know, it's already half full, and we should be you know, aspiring ways to achieve even more. I mean, there are many other ways to you know uh, evaluate. So I wouldn't go any further. But I think another point that is important is, as Pete pointed out, how to have a policy alignment with you know uh, like-minded and also global community. And of course, we know from the uh, mechanism of the Paris uh, Agreement, we have the uh, you know, five-year review programs and also the peer review systems. I think those are the ways that will be always good to see how each country is performing, you know, uh, not you know, on its own scale, but also in the global you know, uh, uh, goal, I mean, objective to achieve the uh, 1.5 degrees goal. What do you think, Pete? Yeah, I think I think that I, I agree. I mean, I think the ambitions, you know, have been lifted significantly um, in the last year of both countries, Japan and the United States. You know, we need to get if we can get there faster, we should. But ultimately, the goal of getting to carbon neutrality by 2050 is where we have to get to. I think the the, the real challenge is in the near term uh, is is 
showing that we're moving fast enough to hit the current set, hit these new goals. Because I don't think that right now the United States has the, we do not currently, I mean, the goal was set, you know, last year, so that's fine, but we, you have to start moving quickly to try to reduce emissions at the rate that, that are currently even being talked about. Um, I mean, the, the, you know, my, my hope is that if you really start moving, then you get a kind of snowball effect, right? I mean, right now you still, as many, while well, we talk about private sector interest and so forth, you know, people are still hedging their bets. There, there, there will be a tipping point at which it's so clear that this is the direction of the economy that, that, that I think it'll sort of accelerate action, but we have not in either country really hit that tipping point. I think we were edging closer to that realization in Europe, um, though obviously the recent events have, have kind of exposed some of their, the underlying vulnerabilities, but also the, 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 the fact that, you know, Europe, Europe's dependence on fossil fuels has become a huge security and strategic liability. And well, and so, you know, we'll, we'll have to see how that, how that plays out as well. But I think that's a, that's a, you know, that's a lesson for the United States and Japan that I think only encourages people who think about this to want to accelerate this transition. I think that's a really good point because uh, let me you know sort of follow up or expand on that because uh, as much as we you know uh, determine both countries you know Japan and the U.S. to achieve its own goal, but I think it will become rather pointless in the you know global uh, you know um, uh, say aspiration for achieve 1.5 degrees target if we you know uh, will not be able to bring in other and regions and countries and of course you know uh, situation and Europe and Ukraine is a you know, prime example, but also I think you know touching on your the next panel and you know subsequent uh, discussions, how to bring in uh, Southeast and Asian countries and others through climate finance and you know other measures. I think that sh should also be an important benchmark in seeing you know how countries like Japan and the U.S., which have resources and capabilities, can to push you know those countries to also uh, you know raise their ambitions. So I think that can all need also be put into the uh, the say evaluation sheet or score in determining how you know each of our, you know our countries are doing. Also, to uh, recap a couple of factors that have already been mentioned, um, one would be uh, we mentioned TCDF climate uh, risk um, disclosure issues, and that's an international organization with recommendations for various countries to adapt, and various countries are moving forward fairly quickly. Uh, EU already has a directive. Essentially, such climate risk disclosure will become mandatory. The US SEC just last week, I, I think of the US as a laggard compared to private sector activity, as Pete already mentioned. Uh, US SEC is putting out a draft uh, requirement for climate risk disclosure for comment. Just did that. And we don't, we'll have to see what the final regulation turns out to be uh, in Japan as well. We're expecting by next year that uh, not only um, prime listed companies, but all listed companies will likely at least have a soft law requirement or maybe even a hard law requirement that they disclose. Um, so we're seeing, I think, pretty rapid progress in that area. And with respect to the private sector, we're seeing a explosion of so-called ESG assets where investors want to invest their funds uh, with people who are going to focus on uh, environmental and other issues. Um, and that would, in, amongst those ESG funds, as I recall, maybe 2020, Morningstar said that 25% of them focused specifically on environmental issues, the most important uh, aspect in attracting assets from investors for these ESG funds. So still a long way to go, I think, is, was everyone's opinion, but also momentum building up in, in some ways, at least. Um, can we go back for a second? Uh, Tomaki already, already talked about it to some degree, um, but Japan and other Asian countries are much more reliant on fossil fuels than uh, in other parts of the world, and also reluctant about nuclear power. Now, I think that not only Japan, but Germany is re-examining seriously the question of use of nuclear power. As I recall, they shut down all their nuclear plants following the Fukushima incident in Japan. Uh, and now there's new talk uh, that they, um, because of uh, energy as a security issue, among other reasons, 
uh, we're moving forward on that. Um, do we have any further thoughts of not only for Japan, but for the world I mean, globally? Um, is nuclear power a realistic long-term option or is it just kind of a medium-term transition form of energy? Um, what can we do in the short and longer term to continue to reduce reliance on fossil fuels? Just to pick up at the, the final part of your question, what we are going to do to reduce the dependency on fossil fuel? I mean, the very clear answer is to increase the you know, use of renewables. I think that's a you know, straight cut answer. And of course, there are some you know, always a continuing challenge of how we'll be able to provide the you know, base load or the reliable source of energy where there's a certain fluctuation that is caused by uh, renewables. But I think they also another way of answering that is to find ways to stabilize those you know, uh, say, uh, provision of uh, uh, sources by ways of if you are going to use solar and wind power, then we should be thinking of how we will have a much you know, reliable source, I mean, adjustment process through either the grid or the uh, battery storage capabilities. I think we don't, I don't think it's inappropriate to just look now whether we only have renewables, we still have to continue, uh, say, fossil fuel, or we have to you know, uh, scale back the nuclear. I think, you know, overall objective, even in Japan, is that uh, we'll be you know, gradually, and this is also written in the energy based uh, program uh, that uh, will be you know, uh, trying as about much as possible to reduce our dependency on nuclear energy. But, you know, the point that I mentioned is that we still have a gap to meet. And I think that might be the near term uh, problem or challenge. But in the long term, I think in order to achieve the uh, carbon neutrality in 2050, I think, you know, the past is rather uh, obvious that we should be investing much even more, uh, and, you know, especially through the private incentives and investments uh, to find that you know uh, renewables and you know, uh, uh, enhanced and uh, connected grid are the uh, uh, say sustainable way of moving forward. Thank you. Um, we've also touched upon Ukraine. Maybe can we take a little closer look at that? Um, I've noticed there have been two kind of different reactions about energy policy, climate change in Ukraine. About a week ago, the Secretary General of the UN seemed alarmed, both by the uneven response to COVID-19 and the invasion of Ukraine, and gave a, said something like, we are now sleepwalking to a climate catastrophe. We're taking a major step backwards in terms of lessening our reliance on fossil fuel. Then at the same time, just yesterday, I think it was, speaking of the private sector, the uh, CEO of BlackRock, Larry Fink, which is the largest fund group and very strongly pushing ESG and green energy investments, he sort of said the opposite. Uh, in the short term, there will be some step back, but in the long term, this is going to be another big impetus for a transition to green energy. So he seemed much more positive. And um, so what do you think? And, and I suppose the reaction may differ according to individual circumstances in different countries. So are you pessimistic or optimistic, short term or long term? Well, I mean, I think it's a, it's a you know, it's a good insight. I think they're, they're probably, uh, I, I, would, I, would, I would hope that I believe that the Secretary General would probably, you know, share the hope that that, that, that is the, you know, the long term over the long term or even over the medium term that this is a spur towards in europe towards towards meeting already what they had in place which were very uh uh really world you know best in class set of ambitions i mean i think the europeans uh and the uk have have really you know have, have moved further politically uh on this issue than anywhere else in the developed world at least, and they are, uh, and yet, you know, and and yet, when when you know, and they were still highly vulnerable to this sort of shock, and this was very foreseeable. But you know, when your lowest cost of fossil energy is that you know is not going to be the first thing out of the system, and so you got to move fast till you can get there. And get off of it. So I, it feels to me, and if you if you if you take seriously their ambitions, 
to reduce their to, to try to reduce by their demand for, by two thirds for Russian energy within the next year collectively. That would be you know an incredible transition and would 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 be a huge huge uh, 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 driver potentially of very you know clean energy solutions, energy efficiency solutions, uh, and. Uh, so I, I think that that, you know, that's right. I think if the, if the, if the route that they take is they just find another more expensive alternative to Russian gas and oil, because those were available and they want to, you know, pay a huge premium for their energy dependence on oil and gas, they can do that. But the economics of clean energy and energy efficiency are just going to be that much more compelling. Very interested here with Tomaki, like how you think of it from a Japanese perspective, because you know, the U.S., this is where the U.S. and Japan are quite different. I mean, the U.S. The U.S. is the world's largest oil and gas producer. Mm -hmm. So we we have a, just a very, in, we have a very different relationship to the, the global energy markets than Japan does. So, you know, how, how you, you might ask Japan, you know, the same sort of question. Well, it's not quite as direct as what Europe's experiencing. You are going to experience the same global market uh, pressures. Uh, and so I, does that how live? I guess my question was like, how live of a debate is this? Are, are they debating this in the absolutely? Diet? Definitely, like, is constantly this, debating. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Because as you know, Japan imports about say you know seven eight percent of its you know liquefied natural gas uh, from Russia, as well as you know uh, le less so, but a few percent of oil and also coal from uh, Russia. So you also have to figure out you know whether how you're going to divert diversify you know uh, this and of course you no know, there's not only like you no know, reasons of uh, economic uh, say uh, affordability of purchasing this oil it was a you know, sort of a strategic investment that we had partner with Russia before uh, the war because you know we had territorial issues that we need to engage uh, with you know, Russia in finding solutions to disputes so they, you know this has been a major sort of you know uh, consideration in at the political and also business leaders so uh, but the, just to you know provide a short answer that I also agree with you know, what Pete has said. In the long term, I think it's always good not to lose sight, even with despite this immediate uh, crisis that we have to deal with, about how we're going to move, you know, uh, to the you know, 1.5 percent target and uh, I mean, degree uh, you know, uh, target, and also uh, to see you know, what are the available options. And definitely in that you know, area, of course, we can't substitute the you know, whole amount of gas and all that we are importing, you know, not only with Russia, but other parts of the world, but to, to focus on the availability of renewables and how we should be able to you know, accelerate that effort. That is the primary way of diversifying. In the very near term, I think we may need to find, you know, just like Pete said, maybe pre, you know, pay additional premium or find other ways but this also goes back to the question of finding the much more sort of a stable market and also to smoothen the uh, transition i should also point out you know it was actually japan who was on the forefront of uh, uh, creating an international market for liquefied natural gas because of the uh, experience from the uh, Oil crisis in the 70s. You know, Japan he heavily invest, uh, in, rely on the you know, oil from the Middle East, and that was one way of for Japan to diversify. And we have also invested in places like you know Vietnam or you know uh, Brazil and other areas. So I think we should also look into that uh, sort of a continuum. But again, the major difference from the 70s and right now is that we have a you know a commitment under Paris, and we should be uh, uh, achieving 1.5 and frankly and i think this is the most appropriate for me to say that uh, uh this is my personal view but uh, we shouldn't use you know uh this immediate crisis an excuse to prolong our dependency on our fossil fuel can I, can, while your hat's off tomaki can i also ask you i mean within the japanese political system is there <laughs> you know in the us you have you know very clear divisions oh, right yes. at the federal level you have the democratic party, the administration pushing for oh. climate legislation. Right. So I was saying how you know, in the United States, it's pretty clear to anybody. You see the, the fight in Was this Washington with Republicans opposed to mm -hmm. the, the Biden administration's climate agenda. Mm -hmm. um, but in Japan, like again, with your hat, you know, as a just as an outsider perspective, mm -hmm. is there like, what's the political debate? I mean, is there is there a, is there a political debate? Is there, is there pressure? How does that, how is that shaping out? Is there within the LDP, outside of the LDP? Mm. 
So even though if I'm taking off my hat, I think I should be a little more cautious in my remarks. <laughs> okay. But uh, uh, I would say that uh, you know because of the strong political leadership and commitment expressed for achieving the you know, uh, uh, 2030 and 2050 target, I think there's a general consensus that this is the you know, sort of direction that we will be moving. But I think it also depends on the degree of how aggressive that should be. And I think there's definitely a strong view that, as I said, for the economic security, for have like a large source of base load for manufacturing industries, there is a strong view that we should not just go directly uh, all the way to the uh, renewables because that's simply not achievable I mean, you know, in the very near term. So I think there are some views that we should be you know, mindful of how to diversify the energy sources. I think that, that major thought is you know, uh, so, you know, emphasizing on energy security point of view. But again, I believe that uh, overall, you know, regardless of the you know, sort of certain different views in the pace of the conversation of the you know, uh, transition, I, I think there's an overall sort of agreement that you know, this is the uh, objective <laughs> we should uh, pursue. But again, I mean, you know, definitely there's a certain added uh, variables or you know, say uh, complexity uh, because of the situation in Europe right now. Whether whether intentionally or not, you just answered one of the questions from our audience, from our NYU colleague, Frank Oppo, who wanted to know about, we heard about the political situation in the US, how about Japan? Mm. Um, moving on to another question. Um, so we've talked about uh, US and Japan cooperation in the climate change area. Um, and we mentioned climate finance, we also mentioned China. Has the approach to China maintained its sort of joint color um, despite the fact that China is a close ally of Russia and everything that's been going on in Ukraine? Has that had any effect on the US-Japan approach to China? Well, I mean, I, well, you can, I can give my, my unofficial position on that. I mean, it, it's, it's, you know, it, it, that situation is still new, <laughs> it's still new. I mean, I don't think that, to, you know, the last two months, clearly we don't know the scale of what the diplomatic and full fallout will be with in terms of China's posture on uh, 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 towards Russia's invasion. I think what you've seen, what, what the Biden administration's approach before that has been very much to allow for the potential for US, China, or multilateral cooperation with China on climate almost maybe apart from any other issue. I mean, you had, you know, the only official to repeatedly go to China last year, other than our deputy, deputy secretary of state who went one time, um, was our special presidential envoy, John Kerry. Uh, they made very clear that they, that was, this was not, you know, uh, to be an area that they were going to, you know, trade off the other issues with that they're concerned about and they're pushing on on human rights issues and security issues and all the other ways in which this administration has really challenged uh, 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 and be, uh, been, you know, uh, aggressive in its posture towards China. But on climate there, as the nature of the problem, their position has been just demands that they that we need China to be part of the solution and that there's ways that we can work together in that space. That said, it has been very slow going. I mean, you, you, and, and difficult. Um, and while, you know, there have been at the last COP in Glasgow, there was a US China announcement that they would be restarting some of these uh, 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 kind of exchanges on a range of issues, um, you know, from methane to other issues around climate change, which is good. That there were, you know, those those are just getting started. So actually, I think we will find out <laughs> now how much this, how much China's position on on the invasion is going to uh, creep in, and 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 would it, and would it change their calculation regarding their interest in, in cooperating on, on climate change to the extent possible? But I think it has been a frustration to the you know, to the Biden administration, frankly, that that China has not done more and been more. Uh, willing to engage uh, on the issue. I think it's also, you know, I think the, chi the, the China looks the other direction and says, you guys just came back to the Paris Agreement. You were gone for four years. You need to start, you know, you need to start demonstrating your own, live up to your own obligations 
uh, before, you know, coming to us and, and, and pushing us to do more. So, you know, there's definitely some tension there, but, um, the, you know, the goal has been to try to bring them to the table uh, and engage with them on climate whenever possible to date. So we'll see. But Tomaki, how, what, how do you see it? Let me, let me interrupt for one second, mm -hmm. because this, uh, your answer is also going to address another question from the audience, mm -hmm. which was exactly that um, China seems to be going somewhat in the other direction with increased uh, use of coal and oil. And the question was, has, has that affected the debate in Japan in any way, in addition to sort of the US-Japan approach to China? Mm. Okay, so first I would like to you know uh, respond to your direct question about the situation in Ukraine and how that you know affects uh, uh, Japan's you know outlook approach vis-a-vis uh, -vis China as we you know follow uh, monitor very closely you know what kind of conversation that uh, uh, Russia and China are having over Ukraine. But I think on that part, the answer is rather simple, regardless of the situation of Europe or the, you know, the energy uh, crisis or price that have been you know, under, uh, on the focus of our conversation until now. I mean, the way to counter the Russian aggression uh, in China should be a part of this international voice and try to uh, make sure that uh, Russia would you know, revert its course. I think you now that's a very consistent message that will be just continuing to uh, send out to our Chinese uh, colleagues, but also, but on the climate front, uh, I think you know, in addition to uh, you know, uh, push China to you know achieve its uh, say commitment, I mean fulfill its commitment to achieve its goals, like uh, what Pete mentioned. I think another area Japan and U.S. and also other partners are working very really closely is to how to hold uh, 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 our Chinese colleagues accountable. Uh, to not only for their achievement of, you know, uh, 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 say, short-term or the uh, long-term uh, strategies or goals, but also uh, for their, you know, practices of lending and other climate areas of climate finance. I think, you know, China does have the capabilities to support, but also, you know, it is important that uh, those, you know, uh, support should be done in the consistent way, as, you know, Pete at the, set, at the outset, you know, the you know, alignment of policies. I think that's really one of the critical areas in order for us to achieve the you know, global goal of 1.5 degrees. And going back to your question about the Chinese, yes, you know, coal production, of course, you know, again, I think, you know, the point that, you know, Pete made that how we'll be uh, following, you know, uh, China's uh, commitment is a very clear answer to that. And, and then I think that should not be used as an excuse for other countries, uh, including Japan, to slow down. We had to sort of overcome that uh, discussion, why we have to go through this you know, uh, um, ambitious goal, why others are not complying. I think you know, the answer should be that we are not, we should you know, not be slowing down because of others. We should be you know, pushing out the, the others to achieve this goal. So I don't think, you know, um, of course, you know, some uh, critical people who you know, you know, uh, are skeptical of the enforcement mechanism of the you know, Paris Agreement and global mechanism may want to make that point. But I think, I mean, the goal is already set to achieve the 1.5. And therefore, I think that you know, the key, uh, say, you know, uh, approach should be to you know, push you know, or prop up you know, countries, not only just China, but also for others to fulfill those objectives. All right. Um, another question from the audience, from our NYU colleague and faculty advisor, Jose Alvarez. So the first two panels of the Gillette Dialogue this year, the first one talked about mitigation, and the second one actually talked about adaptation. Mm -hmm. Rising sea levels are already occurring, so although we want to prevent additional damage, we also must deal with harm already occurring. Has that idea of adaptation been a part of the U.S.-Japan partnership dialogue? Absolutely, definitely, most definitely, because uh, I mean, uh, not just for the climate adaptation, but as you know, Japan is hard hit by many natural disasters. So the resilience has always been a key uh, areas uh, that Japan has been working so closely uh, over decades, especially for countries in Southeast Asia, South Asia, and the rest of the world. And I think the climate crisis have only 
uh, reinforce the, the Japanese conviction that we should be you know, working on ways to mitigate all these you no know, negative effects that is actually happening. And I believe you know, because of all the you know, uh, uh, devastating natural uh, disasters that are caused also in the US and other areas, have you know, made a, a, you know, global sort of awareness that you know, there should be you know, efforts to uh, take measures for adaptation. I believe you know, one of the major difference between the Kyoto and the Paris agreements are that uh, there's a clear emphasis and objective that are set forth for the adaptation. So you know, and Japan and the US have been discussing how to address these issues for not, not only Southeast Asia, but also Pacific Islands, also you know, deforestation, desertification and other areas. So it's certainly an area that we have been working. And uh, yes, I think there's also, as Pete said, so much that needs to be done, even than now. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that it is, it is unfortunately gonna just be a growing problem mm -hmm. because the right now with the missions going where they are, where the impacts are not for, you know, they're all, it's here, it's happening now and it's gonna get worse. And we can't turn this around on a dime. I mean, even if and when we start to really significantly slash emissions, we have, we're gonna, we built so much into the system already that we're gonna have to weather, literally weather these storms. And so the, I do think the other issue that you raise, it's a, is a, so in, on the one hand, you know, we're, we're, we have not invested enough and we've certainly not helped uh, the least developed countries enough. And that I think should be an absolute priority. Um, and we need to do more uh, in the United States, certainly. Um, and uh, in, in that front. And I think that's, that's, that's clear. The other thing, it's cha the challenge partly is, and I think this is why governments have such a new, unique role. We talked a little bit more about the private sector side, but you know, the private sector side can make money off the transition in a good way, right? They're drawn in. You know, if you're a build, if you and you see that they're investing in the clean energy transformation in countries, you see major institutional investors coming together and saying, I mean, they have to sort of deliver, but at least saying we we need to make sure our investments need to be consistent with the clean energy transition that, that needs to happen. We see that as there's there's profit there, um, uh, and that that's the you know that's the sustainable long term path of economic growth. The challenge on adaptation, it's not so easy to draw on the, the, the private sector because some of these things are just what you need government public money for to do. And so that's why the role, I think we need to, of course, figure out where we can draw in you know, public private partnerships. But I think that's really when we have to look at our, at our, at our development assistance and at other form, the, the international financial institutions. I think the US and Japan have, very, have a lot of capacity to be real leaders in the IFIs, the World Bank, the Asian Development Bank, I think there's a lot more that we could actually do um, through those institutions to get at this at this challenge. I, I completely agree that it's an area we need to do more in. Yes, and you know, you know, addition to those uh, climate finance and international uh, finance institutions, which are critical in scaling up, you know, uh, the bilateral assistance that provided by Japan and U.S. I think one of the other areas that Japan and U.S. can directly collaborate is actually in the area of science and technology, because in order for better monitor all the developments of, yes, no, uh, uh, say. Uh, devastation and say uh, through the sea level rises or de or desertifications. I think you know one ex simple example is the you know, data collection and monitoring through satellite imagery and all these you know uh, technologies that have been become so uh, effective in understanding the impact and how to also counter those uh, changing uh, situations. Uh, in fact, I was able to take part in the launch of the Japanese uh, uh, climate change uh, monitoring satellite, which actually works you know, closely with NASA for its monitoring and data dissemination. And this is another area that only governments can do. Of course, how to utilize those data can be done uh, through the work of private sectors. And also there's also another area of big data and uh, algorithms and AI that can be brought in as a future sort of business opportunities. But I think I agree with you, you know, Api, that uh, it's really the governments, you know, not only Japan and US, but also with European Union and others who can take uh, you know, very strong strides in this er these areas. Yes, uh, another question from the audience. <clears throat> uh, for the less developed countries and their challenges for climate change, including adaptation, 
um, we've talked about some governmental initiatives. Is it necessary to create additional private incentives for investors uh, for areas that might not be as profitable at first glance as some of the ESG investments we're already um, witnessing? I think that's sort of, yeah, I mean, I think that's sort of what I was trying to say in the previous example. It, it, I think where possible, but I also think that in some cases, I mean, we certainly certainly want to, but it's why that these adaptation process pro projects really deserve, you know, uh, and warrant this, the public funding that's available. Um, and that there's been real commitments now by countries to increase the share of, of, of financing that goes to adaptation as opposed to clean energy, which is ultimately a good thing because again, once we get, you know, at the end of the day, the point is not to spend as much as money as possible to solve this problem, public money, right? The point, but that, it, but it's to invest in those part in, in in the solutions, based because of how long it took us to solve the problem that we need to, right? I mean that that's that's where you know ultimately uh, over the long term, I, I think that's where the public assistance has to go. Um, but some of it, and I think you know there are attempts to try to find ways to combine those two, but it, 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 it will never, it will never substitute entirely. Yeah, development finance, like, you know, the ones that are done by the uh, JICA, JBIC, or yeah. the Japanese side, DFC, can be used as a sort of a seed money to start, yeah. you know, create incentives. But I think I, you know, echo what uh, Pete said. It also has to be included in the much broader scheme of the rural development, community development, where you can always see the roles of private sectors coming in. You know, standalone financing of the, you know, public sector alone would not be sufficient, and, you know, it may not be sustainable. Sustainable. So I think those are really important uh, insight that we should be constantly uh, bearing in our mind. Okay, final question. Um, we've discussed various measures that both countries are taking and, and globally are being taken to try to address climate change. And I received a comment that in some sense, it sounds like there's a lot of activity. Mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, though, we have newly ambitious goals and does all this is all this activity translating into um, good forward progress? Are we on the right path, uh, good path for ultimately achieving those goals? And uh, what must be done? Or are we in the right direction? Are you overall optimistic about how things are going? Pete, you don't look well, well, I mean, there's no. I mean, so to be clear, we're not on the path. We're not on a glide path. We are better than we are in a better position than we were you know, five years ago, 10 years ago, two, I would say two years ago with the United States now, even though we're still struggling to get, uh, you know, legislation passed at the scale that the Biden administration wants for climate change, you still have the United States now at the federal level attempting to use its, 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 uh, uh, its position and its, its, its authorities to try to activate you know, climate ambition in this country. So, you know, the things that are being done right now by the Biden administration are unprecedented. I mean, you have the SEC, as you mentioned earlier, Bruce, putting out guidelines for disclosure of climate of climate risk associated with all of with the U.S. financial sector. I mean, that's a proposal. We'll see, but no one's proposed it before um, in the United States. So, you know, there are things happening. There's more happening than ever before, but more also, so much more needs to be done that you can't say. You know, we're we can just sit back and watch this happen. So you know, it's a it's 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 both. There's both a lot to build on and a lot to do. Tomaki, yeah, pretty, pretty much the same. So um, you know, so much has been done, and some of the political breakthroughs for the raising ambitions are you know efforts to bring everyone you know on track, but. Uh, as I said at the outset, you know, you know, when we made that uh, commitment or announcement, you know, there's a clear awareness that uh, we have to fill the gap. You know, you just can't achieve as we continue as we do. You know, our say existing efforts. There need to be technological breakthrough or other disrupt disruptive measures, and also enhanced ambitions not only between Japan uh, with Japan and the U.S. but also the rest of the world. 
So, I mean, and also the point that uh, Pete has made before, it's not only by the government, but also private sectors, municipalities, local governments, and other stakeholders that also need to take part in it. So, I mean, you know, as you Americans usually say, it's all hands on deck. And I think, you know, uh, it doesn't even uh, say guarantee the success because there can be many situations that will make us sort of pause like this you know, problem in Ukraine. But again, my emphasis that is that uh, better to focus on where we have done, which is a you know, glass half full, and also to be critically aware that, that there's another half that needs to be filled. So we shouldn't be complacent, but we should also not be overly pessimistic because I think then we won't be achieving you know, in any ways if we just decide that we will abandon the goal and just go only for adaptation. Well, excellent. Uh, I see we're running out of time, unfortunately. So I apologize to the audience members if we didn't get to your questions. Um, I'd like to thank uh, both of our speakers and the audience for what I thought was an informative and, as promised, free-flowing discussion about the climate change issues facing Japan and also the U.S. and, and the world. And uh, as I finally, as I noted at the uh, outset, we will have another panel on corporate governance and climate change in Asia Pacific next week on Wednesday, March 30th. Uh, beginning at 8 p.m. New York time. And I hope you'll be able to join us there. Thank you once again.